Once the first crusaders actually captured Antioch, on June 3rd, 1098, they had to deal with yet another approaching relief army. This time, Kirpoka, Atabeg of Mosul, advanced on Antioch with 35,000 Turks and other Muslim troops. On his arrival, Kirpoka was able to completely encircle the city. After the drawn-out agony of nearly a year-long siege, Antioch lacked provisions, and the Crusaders, now trapped within the city by Kerbaka's army, faced the prospect of starvation or annihilation. Once again, the Crusaders' only option was to fight, and once again, they turned to Bohemond to act as general. Kerbaka's troops were numerous and his position strong, but within the Turkish forces, there were internal divisions between jealous emirs, says historian Thomas Madden, citing the potential fractiousness of Kerboga's vast coalition army. Nevertheless, the Turkish Atabegs seemed poised to capture Antioch and destroy the Christian forces inside. By late June, Count Raymond of Toulouse was ill. Thus, it fell to Bohemond alone to lead the upcoming counterattack against Kerboga. In choosing to confront Kerboga head-on, the Crusaders faced several enormous challenges. For one, Kerbaga's army greatly outnumbered them. Also, the Turks had plenty of horses, while the Crusaders by now had no more than 200 horses of military quality remaining. The majority of their troops would have to fight on foot. But Bohemond also understood that the Crusaders who had survived up to this point had been hardened into a battle-tested, efficient fighting force. The trials of war had bound them with the brotherhood of soldiers who have long fought shoulder to shoulder. Bowman's battle plan was astounding, writes historian Thomas Asbridge, its execution exceptional. Bowman chose the bridge gate for the sallying point, placing the Latins on the western bank of the Orontes, preventing the Turkish troops on the eastern bank from quickly engaging them. First to emerge from the city was a division of archers under Hugh of Vermandois, which hammered the Turks with arrows, driving back the first line of Mohammedan troops and opening a space for the remainder of the Crusader army to deploy. Bohemond had divided the remainder of the army into five distinct divisions to provide cohesion in the midst of battle. Once the bridge gate had been cleared, the northern French, under Robert of Flanders, and Robert of Normandy, emerged in column behind Hugh's archers, and then maneuvered to his left. Next, Godfrey of Bouillon marched out with his Lotharingians and Germans, followed by Bishop Adamar leading the southern French. Each division fanned out leftwards in a semicircle, with Bohemond commanding the largest and final contingent, allowing him to bring aid to any portion of the army that came under heavy attack. Thomas Asbridge calls this disposition of the troops the finest expression of Bowman's military genius. But despite this well-ordered deployment, had Kerboka reacted differently, the Crusaders might have been crushed as they came out of Antioch. Once he realized that the Crusaders were sallying forth from the bridge gate, Kerboka had two options. Immediately attack with his main force, or wait and meet them in battle on grounds of his own choosing. Kerpaka chose the latter, probably because he did not judge the ragged Crusader army to be much of a threat. Had he launched an immediate attack, he could have inflicted heavy losses, but he also would have ended the battle before the Christians were fully deployed. No doubt the bulk of their numbers would have retreated, and many might not have even deployed at all. Instead, Kerpaka chose to allow the Franks to bring the whole of their army out of Antioch thus giving him the opportunity to crush them completely in one grand stroke. This would allow him to avoid a long siege. But this doesn't mean the Crusaders were able to march unmolested out of Antioch. While Kerbogah's main force held back, the Crusaders, as they struggled to get into position before the bridge gate, were attacked fiercely by the advanced Turkish troops. There was a vicious counterattack from the Turks who had been guarding the bridge gate, followed almost instantly by an assault from the Turks sweeping down from the positions before the Gate of St. Paul and the Gate of the Duke. Most pressing of all, Turks positioned before the Gate of St. George quickly began crossing the river and coming up behind the Crusaders for an attack. The Christians were surrounded. 
Militarily, this was a near impossible situation to survive. A small, infantry-based army, while attempting to deploy out of a narrow gate, was being heavily attacked from all sides by enemy cavalry. At this crucial moment, the Crusaders, by now tested in countless battles against the Turks, rose to the challenge. The knight Reinhard of Toul was dispatched with a contingent of French and Lotharingians, and they met the southeastern attack with such ferocity that the enemy broke in panic. Meanwhile, the main body of the Franks held formation against the onslaught of Turkish arrows, just as they'd done at Dori Laim. Unbroken by the Turkish onslaught, and united as a solid, impenetrable body of infantry, the Crusaders now marched forward, fighting with precision and ferocity. Before this powerful counterattack, the Turkish advance guard utterly broke, turning tail and fleeing. Kerpaka, realizing what was going on, began a rushed, panicked advance and ran right into his own retreating troops. This caused more Turkish units to break off and retreat. Meanwhile, the Crusader infantry continued their advance, shattering the Turkish formations with brutal efficiency. It wasn't long before the entire Turkish coalition was in full flight, with Kerbaka himself barely escaping with his life. It was over. A tiny army of weary, hungry Christian soldiers had utterly shattered an enormous, well-equipped Turkish army. Within hours, the Turkish troops inside the citadel surrendered to Bohemond, and now the whole of Antioch, truly, was securely in Christian hands. It was an astounding victory, probably the most important of the First Crusade. Now the way lay open for the march on the ultimate prize, Jerusalem. The Crusaders acted quickly to secure the newly conquered Jerusalem. On July 22, 1099, Godfrey of Bouillon was elected defender of the Holy Sepulchre, ruler of the nascent kingdom of Jerusalem. It's popularly believed that Count Raymond IV of Toulouse was unhappy with Godfrey's election, but historians John and Loretta Hill conclude that Raymond very likely concurred in Godfrey's appointment as defender of Jerusalem. Soon word arrived from Tancred, who was scouting the southern coast, that indeed a Fatiman army at Ascalon was preparing to march on Jerusalem. Godfrey's response was to rally the Christian forces to the offensive. While the Latin and Greek clergy gathered together in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre to pray for victory, Godfrey, along with the forces of Robert of Flanders, marched south, rendezvousing at Ramla with the armies of Raymond of Toulouse and Robert of Normandy, as well as Tancred, who had captured Nablus earlier that month. The newly elected Patriarch Arnulf carried the relic of the true cross at the head of the Christian host. Al-Afdal, the Egyptian vizier, had assembled a massive army made up of troops from all over the Fatiman Caliphate. He camped out in the plain of Al-Majdal, just outside of Ascalon, with the plan of next marching on Jerusalem to drive out the Franks. He was unaware that the Crusaders were already on the move. Godfrey and Raymond divided their forces into nine divisions, then rapidly advanced on the Fatimid position. On August 12th, the Fatimids were caught unawares when the Crusaders attacked. Unlike the Turks, the Fatimids did not employ large numbers of mounted archers, and their lance-wielding Arab and Berber cavalry, which moved closely with their infantry, provided a solid target for the devastating Frankish cavalry charge. Historian R.C. Smale says that the charge alone secured a Latin victory, and the best sources agree that the duration of the battle was brief. al afdals troops scattered, and, as Fulcair of Chartres writes, in the sweeping attack the Saracens perished on all sides. The entire Egyptian camp, filled with horses and provisions, was captured by the Christians. It is popularly believed that, in the aftermath of their defeat, the Fatimids at Ascalon offered to surrender the city to the Crusaders, but a quarrel erupted between Raymond and Godfrey over who would possess it. The Fatimids, hearing of this quarrel, broke off negotiations, and Ascalon was lost to the Crusaders. The source of this tale comes from Ralph of Conn and Albert of Aachen, neither of whom were present at the battle, and both of whom were biased against Count Raymond. Our best Saracen source, Ibn al-Kalanisi, 
offers a very different account. The Franks besieged Ascalon, until at length the townsmen agreed to pay them 20,000 dinars as protection money, and to deliver this sum to them forthwith. They therefore set about collecting this amount from the inhabitants of the town, but it befell that a quarrel broke out between the Frankish leaders, and they retired without having received any of the money. Ibn al-Kalanisi, unimpacted by the various regional loyalties of the Latin chroniclers, is probably our best source for this incident. He says nothing about a specific quarrel between Godfrey and Raymond, just that some sort of disagreement resulted in a failure to collect tribute from Ascalon, but not a missed opportunity to actually possess the city itself. An offer of total surrender of Ascalon at this stage seems questionable, as the city was well fortified. The disagreement may have been, as John and Loretta Hill point out, that most crusaders considered their vows fulfilled and were not interested in aiding the leaders in a full-on siege of the city. The crusader victory at Ascalon meant that Jerusalem was secure as a Christian possession. After Richard had defeated Saladin at Acre and Arsuf, and consolidated his hold over the coastal plain, Richard made some raids toward Jerusalem, but stopped short of actually besieging the holy city. Saladin recognized this as the moment when he might finally turn the tide, and so made a bold move. On July 27, 1192, while Richard was at Acre, Saladin moved a sizable force on Jaffa, which Richard had reconquered from Saladin the previous year. Saladin's army overwhelmed the Christian garrison. Three days later, the Muslim troops stormed the city walls, while the garrison retired to the citadel and sent to Saladin for terms. Saladin promised the Christians they could leave with their lives and property, and that the city would not be pillaged, but he couldn't control his troops. His Kurds and Turks sacked Jaffa. Furious, Saladin posted his Mamluks by the city gates to take the booty off the Muslim troops as they came out. At Acre, Richard heard of Saladin's attack. Though he only had a small force of knights with him, he sailed for Jaffa. Seeing Saladin's banners flying over the walls, Richard grabbed a Danish axe and, according to Ernol, the squire of Balian of Ibelin, swore that by God's calves they will not capture the Christians. Jumping off the boat into the shallows, Richard waded through the waves in his armor. Forty-four knights, a few hundred infantry, and a force of Italian crossbowmen followed him. In a lightning assault, Richard penetrated Jaffa and cut through Saladin's men. Richard personally battled through Jaffa's narrow streets, shoulder to shoulder with his knights. As quickly as Jaffa had fallen, she came back under Richard's control, and he'd accomplished this with a tiny fraction of the men that Saladin had used to take her. Horrified at the swiftness of Richard's victory, Saladin nevertheless believed it would be easy to crush so small a force. On August 5th, Saladin waited until dark and launched his cavalry, numbering in the thousands. Characteristically, Richard was ready. He'd drawn up his men in a shield wall formation outside the city. When Saladin's troops saw the Christians standing ready to meet them, they lost heart and simply refused to attack. A few of Saladin's most dedicated Mamluks did charge the enemy, but suffered heavy losses. Richard himself fought at the front line. Saladin's servant and biographer, Baha ad-Din, records his disappointment at the performance of the Muslim troops. The enemy stood firm and did not move from their positions. Like dogs of war, they snarled, willing to fight to the death. Our troops were frightened of them, dumbfounded by their steadfastness. The number of their cavalry was estimated at the most as 17 and at least as 9, and their foot were less than a 1,000. Some said 300, others more than that. The sultan was greatly annoyed at this and personally went around the divisions urging his men to attack and promising them good reward if they would. Nobody responded to his appeal. I have heard that al-Jana, al-Mashtub's brother, said to the sultan, 
Your Mamluks who beat people off the day Jaffa fell and took their booty from them, tell them to charge. The Sultan saw that to stand face to face with this insignificant detachment without taking any action was a sheer loss of face. It was reported to me that the King of England took his lance that day and galloped from the far right wing to the far left and nobody challenged him. The Sultan was enraged and turned his back on the fighting. As Baha ad-Din noted, Richard publicly exposed the refusal of Saladin's troops to fight by riding alone up and down their lines while they all stood watching. Saladin was furious over Richard's victory. Ernol tells us that so great was Saladin's anger that he tortured to death two Christian prisoners in his possession, the knight Aubrey of Rheims and the bishop of Bethlehem. In attacking Jaffa suddenly, while Richard was north at Acre, Saladin was attempting to reverse all that Richard had achieved, for it was Saladin's goal to eliminate the crusader presence in the Levant. Had Saladin been able to successfully take Jaffa, Acre would have been threatened, and Saladin would not have had to treat with the crusaders. Saladin must be admired for the boldness of this move. Had it worked, it would have restored his prestige, which had been badly damaged by Richard's victories and would have made the crusader presence on the coast untenable. Saladin made this move at the right time, when Richard had refused to commit to an attack on Jerusalem. The first moment of relief Saladin had received in Richard's relentless advance, and yet the Lionheart's countermove was perhaps beyond anything Saladin could have expected even from Richard. Richard had a way of inspiring his troops through his personal courage. And it's easy to see how Richard's men pushed themselves to the limit as they fought beside him. A lesser man with a small band of troops would have stood no chance of hurling back the army of the greatest general in Islam that day. By defeating Saladin at Jaffa, Richard secured the coastal crusader kingdom. If we evaluate the outcome of the Third Crusade, we see Richard achieving more of his goals than Saladin. Richard's goals were, one, to halt Saladin's war effort, and two, to restore the kingdom of Jerusalem as it had existed prior to 1187. Richard restored the majority of the kingdom, and even added to it by wresting Cyprus from one of Saladin's Greek allies. Only Jerusalem and the important fortress Karak on the eastern side of the Jordan remained out of Richard's reach, and Saladin must be admired for his ability to hold on to these despite being repeatedly defeated by Richard. Ascalon was lost to both sides for the time being, demolished as a result of the treaty, though it would be quickly reoccupied by the Crusaders after Saladin's death. In terms of his goals, Saladin was almost entirely thwarted. His great project to remove the Crusaders from the Levant failed utterly. One consequence of Richard's victory was the economic devastation of Egypt. Saladin's plan of economic partnership between Acre and Alexandria was shattered, and instead the Christians maintained a prominent trading power in their Levantine ports. Historian Andrew Ehrenkreutz summarizes the results of the Third Crusade. In spite of overwhelming odds in their favor, the Muslims could neither outfight the Christian contingent nor simultaneously protect Ascalon and Jerusalem. Considering the military organization and defense-oriented economy of the Muslim countries, and in view of the strategic advantages they secured in 1187 through 89, the terms of the 1192 armistice must be regarded as a humiliating concession the Christian invaders imposed on Islam. In 1195, the powerful Almohad Caliphate controlled all of Mohammedan North Africa and Al-Andalus. It was ruled by Abu Yusuf Yaqub al-Mansur, a capable general and statesman who'd subdued the Almoravid dynasty in North Africa. Al-Mansur's father had been killed in battle with the King of Portugal, and he was deeply committed to the Jihad against the Christian states of Spain. In 1194, a temporary truce between the Christian Kingdom of Castile and the Almohad Caliphate expired. Bishop Martin of Toledo and the warrior monks of Calatrava attacked the Almohad-controlled Guadalcavir River Valley, a crucial frontier region over which the Christians and Mohammedans had been sparring for some time. 
Castile was ruled by King Alfonso VIII, a shrewd politician and talented general. To protect his capital of Toledo, Alfonso had constructed an impressive castle at El Arcos, on the left bank of the Guadiana River. When he received news that Almansor planned to invade Castile, Alfonso assembled his army at El Arcos, ready to stand in defense of Castile's southern border. After landing at Tarifa in June 1195, Almansor proclaimed the renewal of jihad, then advanced to Cordoba. He marched north through the Puerto del Muradal, then captured Calatrava Castle, home to the military order of Calatrava. In anticipation of the Caliph's arrival, King Alfonso VIII had sent for aid to Aragon and Leon. However, rather than wait for these reinforcements, Alfonso chose to engage the enemy. It was July 19th. The Caliph had assembled a very large army, and his forces considerably outnumbered the Castilian host. Large contingents from various Berber tribes comprised Al-Mansur's vanguard, while an Arab host held the left wing. Divisions from Al-Andalus held the right. The Caliph kept his best Almohad forces in reserve in the rear. Alfonso's vanguard was commanded by his vassal and close friend, Diego Lopez de Haro, who led a charge that smashed the Berber vanguard. Alfonso himself led another attack with the military orders, routing several of Al-Mansur's key divisions. Hours into the battle, the Christians appeared to have the advantage, despite being outnumbered. Once most of the Berbers had been defeated, the Christian knights engaged closely with the Andalusian troops, which they also broke and scattered. However, the Arab cavalry managed to flank Alfonso's army, and the Caliph still held his Almohad rearguard in reserve. By the time Al-Mansur launched his elite Almohad warriors, the Christian cavalry had been charging and fighting hard for hours. The Almohad reserve was fresh, and along with the remaining Arab contingents enveloped the Castilian host, the exhausted Christian knights were simply overwhelmed. Alfonso himself charged into the thick of the fighting, trying to rally his men. The king was ready to die in battle, but his own bodyguards dragged him from the field. The Christian infantry was destroyed, the military orders wiped out. Alfonso's army retreated in disorder to Toledo. Meanwhile, Al-Mansur occupied Alarcos, Calatrava, and other fortresses that protected the road to Toledo. Loaded down with spoils, Al-Mansur retired in triumph to Sevilla. During the Octave of Pentecost, May 13th through the 22nd, in 1212, King Alfonso VIII of Castile began gathering his army in Toledo to prepare for the campaign against Al-Nasir, the Almohad Caliph. In addition to Alfonso's Castilian vassals, the army included the Templars, Hospitallers, and the Orders of Santiago and Calatrava. The Archbishop of Narbonne, Arnold Omri, arrived on June 3rd with many French knights. Alfonso's daughter, Princess Berengela, described these men as pilgrims, which provides us some insight into how closely Spanish crusading was associated with the crusade in the Holy Land. Arnold Omri had more good news. On his way to Toledo, he'd met with the King of Navarre, who'd also agreed to join. The kings of Leon and Portugal didn't personally join the crusade, but many Leonese and Portuguese knights traveled to Toledo to aid the cause. On May 20th, King Alfonso rode to the gates of Toledo to warmly welcome King Pedro II of Aragon. Surprisingly, Pedro arrived with only a single knight, more of his vassals would arrive soon, but Pedro lacked the funds to finance his army. King Alfonso offered to pay to provision the Aragonese forces. The King of Castile also outfitted the French with horses. The Christian coalition departed Toledo on June 20th. Meanwhile, in Sevilla, Al-Nasir had massed a vast army of North African and Andalusian Moors and set out for the north on June 22nd, his sights set on Toledo. As the two armies inched closer toward one another, French knights in the vanguard of the crusader host captured Malagon, 45 miles south of Toledo, slaughtering the garrison. Alfonso was unhappy with this, since he didn't want Muslim troops in the fortresses ahead to be afraid to surrender to him. The next castle they encountered was Calatrava, which the Christians besieged for four days. 
When Calatrava surrendered on July 1st, Alfonso refused to allow it to be plundered, which greatly disappointed the French. By July 3rd, the Latin Chronicle tells us that many of the French knights were complaining of the scorching summer heat and the fact that they still hadn't encountered Al Nasir. Despite Alfonso and Pedro trying to dissuade them, the bulk of the French now picked up and headed back home. Theobald of Blazon, with around 130 Occitan knights, remained. The Christian army spent July 5th and 6th capturing three more castles in the region, including Alarcos, the site of the great Almohad victory 17 years earlier. At this point, another Iberian king joined them, Sancho VII of Navarre. The Latin chronicler says that the army was truly marvelous to behold. Never before, he insisted, had so many Christian knights been gathered together. The crusaders continued their march south, advancing on the Puerto de Maradal. However, scouts returned with dire news. Al Nasir was close, and now held the crucial pass of the Puerto de Loza. The caliph's army was well situated and enormous, outnumbering the Christians by perhaps two to one. Alfonso immediately laid camp and held council in his tent, gathering together his vassal and close friend, Diego Lopez de Haro, the King of Aragon, the King of Navarre, Archbishop Rodrigo of Toledo, Archbishop Arnold Omri, and the Masters of the Temple, Hospital, Santiago and Calatrava. Some argued for a withdrawal, insisting that it would be impossible to advance through the mountains with Al Nasir at Losa. Others, including Alfonso, insisted that now, with so large a force gathered, was the time to decisively strike. Unable to agree, the leaders decided to pray on the matter overnight. After the council, however, a local Christian shepherd was brought before Alfonso, who insisted that he knew an alternate pass through the mountains. Thus, at daybreak on July 13th, the crusaders, guided by this shepherd, crossed the steep slopes and valleys through the Puerto de Mordal. They then advanced to Las Navas de Toloza, coming face to face with the enormous Almohad army. The Moors were surprised to awaken and find the Christians coming up behind them to lay camp. The night before the battle, the clergy heard confessions. At midnight, July 16th, the Archbishop of Toledo said Mass and all the Crusaders received the body of Christ in the Eucharist. Then they took up arms and prepared for combat. Pedro II commanded the Aragonese on the left wing, while Sancho VII and the Navarrese held the right. The military orders and the Castilians occupied the center under King Alfonso, the Archbishop of Toledo, and Diego Lopez de Haro. Before the Christians, the Almohad army was arrayed in its vast ranks of Arabs and Berbers. Al Nasir held the rear, surrounded by his fearsome Moorish bodyguard. When the battle began, the Christian front lines quickly closed with the Moors, so there was little time or distance for archers. The fighting was close and raged furiously all day. The Templars and the Knights of Calatrava made up the front lines and were hard pressed. For a time, the Christians seemed likely to be overwhelmed by the superior numbers of the Mohammedans. However, the Aragonese and the Navarrese carried out a pincer movement, which threw the Almohad ranks into disorder, allowing King Alfonso and the Archbishop of Toledo to execute a charge with the Castilian Knights. This was the decisive moment. The Almohad lines collapsed. The Christian Knights mowed down the enemy, and Al Nasir's troops broke in confusion. The King of Navarre and his knights penetrated all the way to Al Nasir's tent, breaking through his bodyguard, though the Caliph himself just barely escaped with his life. The Crusader victory was absolute. Thousands of Muslim troops lay dead on the field. The Christian kings took possession of the Caliph's camp, while the Caliph himself fled in humiliation back to Sevilla. The tapestry over the Caliph's tent was sent as a war prize to the monastery at Las Huelgas, where it can still be seen to this day. King Alfonso shipped the Caliph's tent and standard to Pope Innocent in Rome, along with the triumphant announcement of the victory. Pope Innocent was overjoyed. News of the triumph spread all over Europe, eliciting much praise and thanks to God. Alfonso's daughter, Berengela, sent news of the victory to her sister, Blanche, wife of Prince Louis in France. The victory at Las Navas de Toloza proved decisive. The Almohad menace to Spain was ended. From now on, the Mohammedans of Al-Andalus would be on the defensive. In the coming decades, 
the sons and grandsons of the kings who conquered at Las Navas would capture virtually all the important Moorish-held cities in Al-Andalus, including Valencia, Cordoba, and Sevilla. <laughs> 